Hi everyone. Welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilovepathology.com. In continuation with the diseases of hematopoietic system or hematopathology, we have been discussing about myeloproliferative neoplasms, right? In my earlier session, I had discussed in detail about chronic myeloid leukemia and today let us talk about a very important topic in hematopathology. Another myeloproliferative neoplasm, which is polycythemia vera. In the next 10 to 15 minutes, let's look into the etiopathogenesis, the clinical features, the morphology, the diagnosis and treatment of polycythemia vera. So, polycythemia vera, by definition, is a myeloproliferative neoplasm along with chronic myeloid leukemia, essential thrombocytosis, which is characterized by increased marrow production of red blood cells, granulocytes and platelets and that's why it is pan myelosis. However, the increase in the red cells that is polycythemia is the predominant manifestation and it is responsible for most of the clinical symptoms of polycythemia vera. Now, when we talk about polycythemia, it's very important to understand the differences between relative polycythemia and absolute polycythemia. Relative polycythemia meaning it is because of reduced plasma volume and because of dehydration, whereas absolute polycythemia is due to actual increase in the red cell mass. And this absolute polycythemia is further categorized into either due to primary or secondary causes. The primary is the one what, what we are studying today, polycythemia vera, whereas the secondary uh, polycythemia is because of increased erythropoietin levels which further result in increase in the red cell mass. For example, in conditions like hypoxia, in various tumors, because of paraneoplastic syndromes, you have secondary polycythemia due to increased erythropoietin production. Now, moving on to the epidemiology, the incidence of polycythemia is more or less similar to that of chronic myeloid leukemia. It's around 1 to 3 cases per lakh population, usually in adults or middle-aged individuals. What is important to understand is why does polycythemia occur? The main pathogenesis is because of mutation in JAK, JAK2 gene. JAK stands for Jason kinase and this gene is located on the chromosome number 9. It is on the short term of the chromosome number 9 which encodes a protein called JAK2. Okay, So, this JAK2 is a non-receptor tyrosine kinase protein. Remember, in chronic myeloid leukemia, we talked about the receptor tyrosine kinase one. Whereas this one is a non-receptor tyrosine kinase protein. Now let us understand the JAK STAT pathway before we uh, understand the concepts of polycythemia vera. Consider this is the cytoplasmic, I mean membrane, plasma membrane of the hematopoietic stem cell. These are the growth factors for the you know proliferation of these hematopoietic stem cell. And for example, the growth factors include it could be erythropoietin, it could be thrombopoietin, or it could be granulocyte, monocyte, colony stimulate factor. For every growth factor, you have a growth factor receptor. The cytoplasmic domain of the growth, growth factor receptor has this JAK protein. The steps of JAK STAT pathway is initial step is the EPO binds to the receptor. Okay. And once the EPO binds to the receptor, the JAK protein gets activated by phosphorylation. Okay, can you see this phosphate ions, you know, binding to the JAK protein? So JAK gets activated. Once the JAK gets activated, what it does is the STAT proteins which are circulating in the cytoplasm, they are recruited and they are also activated. Okay. And these STAT proteins, after activation, they dimerize. And this dimerized STAT proteins enter into the nuclei and then it acts on the genetic component, activating the genes responsible for RBC production, survival and proliferation of the erythroid progenitor cells. Okay, So, this is the JAK STAT pathway, which is receptor mediated. 
Now, what happens if there is JAK2 gene mutation? So, this is JAK2 protein, okay, and this protein is developed or uh, synthesized with the help of a JAK2 gene, right? If the JAK2 gene is mutated, now what is JAK2 gene mutation? Basically, it, in around 97 percent of cases, the valine is replacing the phenyl alanine at position 617. That's why it's called JAK2 V617 F mutation. Okay, and once there is mutation of the JAK2 gene, this makes the JAK stat pathway overactive. Okay, it is overactive now. And what is important about this overactive pathway is that the hematopoietic stem cells become growth factor independent. You no longer need the help of growth factor for the JAK protein to be activated because of mutation, it itself is overactive now. Okay, and the cell grows on its own. So, basically, what I am trying to tell you now is that there is no requirement of erythropoietin. We are not talking about polycythemia vera, right? There is no requirement of erythropoietin without having erythropoietin levels itself. The hematopoietic stem cell starts proliferating because of the mutation of this particular protein which further activates the jack stack pathway i hope you have understood this concept very clear right okay now the jack 2 mutation by itself are of two types one is heterozygous mutation another is homozygous mutation what are the differences between heterozygous and homozygous in heterozygous only one copy has the v617f mutation Whereas in homozygous, both the copies have the mutation. Okay, and this both the copies have mutation basically because of either due to duplication or mitotic recombination. Now, majority of the cases of polycythemia vera has only one copy mutation, which is heterozygous state. Okay, and homozygous state is usually, I mean, is found in around 25 to 30 percent of polycythemia vera patients. What happens in heterozygous? Same thing. It is there is uncontrolled red cell growth, especially the uh, I mean the un uncontrolled cell growth. Basically, there is proliferation of all the three lineages, but then the red cells are the ones which are predominantly affected. Whereas in homozygous state, apart from the red blood cells, there is increased WBCs, there is extra medullary hematopoiesis resulting in a big spleen, there is itching, there is faster progression to the spent phase of polycythemia, which means this: these are the patients which can go in for fibrosis of the marrow at a very early stage. The disease severity is moderate in heterozygous state, whereas as we saw in homozygous state, the disease severity is very, very severe. One thing is important to note that the signals, the JAK2 signals are quantitatively much weaker as compared to what we saw in CML and that's why the proliferative drive is lesser than in CML. Okay. Now, let's look into the morphology of polycythemivira in the peripheral smear as the hematocrit increases, you know, the smear shows close packing and cell distortion. Usually, it is normocytic and normochromic unless and until you have a secondary iron deficiency where you have microcytic hypochromic blood picture. Neutrophilia will be seen with some lift shift to the left, whereas basophilia is often present. There is moderate amount of thrombocytosis and usually they have abnormally large platelets. These are all the peripheral smear findings. Whereas in the bone marrow, the marrow is hypercellular because we, talk, we we know that the polycythemia vera is pan myelosis. It has pan myelosis, right? Because there is increase in the red cell progenitors, usually accompanied by increase in granulocytic as well as the megakaryocytes. Okay. Apart from this, there is moderate increase or marked increase in the reticulin fibers in around ten percent of cases. Later in the course of the disease, when we call this as a spent phase. You know what? The marrow fibrosis becomes very, very extensive and to an extent that it displaces the hematopoietic cells. Organs are also enlarged. Initially, it is enlarged because of congestion, whereas in the later stage, the organs enlargement is due to increased extramedullary hematopoiesis. Okay. In the later stage, the polycythemia where a patient presents with marked or the prominent organomegaly. Now, what are the clinical features of polycythemia? Where as we have mentioned earlier, most of the clinical features is because of increase in the red cell mass. Okay, Increased red cell mass, the increased hematocrit and increased bed volume is what 
uh, is the most important reason for the clinical manifestation of polycythemia vera, which includes you now there could be abnormal blood flow, particularly on the lower pressure, venous side of the circulation. The patient is usually plethoric and cyanotic, and that's because of stagnation and deoxygenation of the blood in the peripheral vessels. Patient can present with headache, dizziness, migraine kind of headache, dizziness, hypertension, and gastrointestinal symptoms. They often present with intense pruritis and even peptic ulceration, and that's because of release of histamine by the increased number of basophils. Uh, because there is high cell turnover, you have hyperuricemia and because of hyperuricemia, symptomatic gout can be a manifestation in up to 5-10% to of cases of polycythemia vera. And the most important, the most dreaded ones are increased risk of both major bleeding and thrombotic episodes. And that's because of abnormal blood flow and abnormal platelet function. Now, what are all the thrombotic episodes we should we should think of? One, it could be deep venous thrombosis, it could be myocardial infarction or the stroke, it could be hepatic vein thrombosis resulting in Bhatshayari syndrome, it could be portal and mesenteric vein thrombosis which can result in bubble wall infarction. The major bleeding manifestations are usually they are uh, in the form of epistaxis or bleeding gums, bleeding gums which is most more common. Life-threatening hemorrhages is usually rare. Uh, uh, around, sorry about that. That's around 10% of 5 to 10% of cases you have life-threatening hemorrhages. Now, how do you diagnose polycythemia? The WHO, uh, you know, have come out with criteria to diagnose polycythemia, which is categorized into major and minor criteria. There are three major criteria and one minor criteria. The three major criteria are one, elevated hemoglobin concentration. If it is male, I mean, if the patient is male, it should be more than 16.5 grams per deciliter, whereas 16 grams per deciliter in case of women are elevated hematocrit, more than 45 in men and more than 48% in women. 49% in men and 48% in women. Second major criteria is bone marrow biopsy showing age-adjusted hypercellularity. Okay, you have to match the hypercellularity based on the age. Okay, and that too with high lineage growth. It's called pan myelosis. That's the reason why it is referred to as pan myelosis. Third important major criteria is presence of JAK2 mutation, particularly the V617F mutation. If you don't find that, even if you find JAK2 exon 12 mutation, that is also enough. These are the three major criteria. And the only minor criteria is subnormal serum erythropoietin levels. Okay. Now, what is the diagnostic criteria? It may you should have either all three major criteria or the first two major criteria and the sub I mean, the minor criteria and one minor criteria which is that is the subnormal serum erythropoietin level i hope you i hope the concepts are clear right all three major criteria or the first two major and the minor criteria is diagnostic of polycythemia vera now how do you treat polycythemia vera See, uh, phlebotomy is the mainstay in the treatment because you have to maintain the red cell mass because we know that the symptomatology, the complications are because of increased red cell mass. You have to maintain the red cell mass at nearly normal levels. We have seen BC, we have seen in CML, the BCR, ABL, you know, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which really helps the patient in achieving remission in majority of the patients whereas in polycythemia vera the jak2 inhibitors do not really work well okay they are not really effective so far so the treatment with medications is still not really good all one has to do is phlebotomy and maintain the red cell mass at nearly normal levels prognosis most of the patients, you know, 15 to 20 percent of patients, after an average period of 10 years of diagnosis, they develop myelofibrosis. In around 2 percent of cases, it can transform into acute myeloid leukemia. Remember, it is myeloid leukemia. In contrast to CML, where we saw CML can progress 
to either acute myeloid or lymphoid because transformation or you know to ALL acute lymphoblastic leukemia is extremely unlikely which means to say that the cell of origin being a progenitor committed to myeloid differentiation okay and that's why you don't see acute lymphoblastic leukemia as a progression as a complication in case of polycythemia vera so that's all about polycythemia vera we have talked about data pathogenesis clinical features morphology the diagnostic criteria and a bit about treatment hope you have liked this video thank you for watching if you have like click on that like button do comment if you have anything to ask do consider subscribing if you have liked this video and don't forget to share with your friends stay tuned i will be coming out with a few more interesting topics in hematopathology in my subsequent sessions bye bye